Friday. This is Kaui Lucas back on Hawaii is my mainland here on Think Tech Hawaii where we are here always on Fridays at 3 p.m. This, um, this week I have Senator Laura Thielen from, I used to be her constituent when I was living in Waimanalo. She is the senator for Kailua, Waimanalo, and Hawaii Kai. And um, today there's um, a whole bunch of stuff happening at the, at the legislature and she's going to um, dig a little deeper on some of the things that it's hard to understand in the usual sound bites. So, um, Laura, let's start with ethics. How about that? <laughs> ethics is a good topic for the legislature to delve into because really, um, if you don't have a very strong ethics code and people lose faith in their government and they stop participating, um, then our government's going to become a lot weaker and we end up being governed by the very few instead of by the many, and that's and, what a democracy is. And we get some very interesting candidates, too. Yes. Uh, fomented by anger and frustration. <laughs> so they say sunshine is the best disinfectant, you know, just to uh. make sure that you have public information. Um, nowadays, thanks to the internet, once information is public and it's accessible, people can share it and then they can make an informed decision about their government officials, about how they want to um, recommend we vote on bills, uh, who they want to vote for themselves, how they want to vote on constitutional amendments or other issues. So ethics, is it's really important that we get the information out there. So what's happening in this season um, in ethics-wise, maybe in uh, campaign finance? Okay. Well, um, we've done some work over the past few years on campaign finance. There's been a lot of concern since the Citizens United case about what they call dark money going into politics and funding campaigns. And we've been able to pass some laws that do require um, publication of information so that when people donate or PACs donate, they have to, to give information about where their donations come from. But the area that I have a um, special concern about now is the ethics code. Um, I, other elected officials, and appointed officials have to file ethics disclosures about where our sources of income uh, come from so that people can see if we have a potential conflict of interest and in decisions that we're making. And those ethics laws, uh, I don't feel, are as strong as they, they should be, so the public doesn't have all the information they need. How accessible is that? The ethics disclosures are under the um, Hawaii State Ethics Commission, and you can go online and you can pull those up by candidate. Um, but I think we need to have stronger laws about um, not just the, the candidates and the lobbyist disclosures, but also um, what kind of lobbying is going on of the executive branch. So, for instance, a lobbyist would have to say how much money they may be spending in lobbying me and other people at the legislature for voting on a bill. But there's a lot of decisions that are made by officials in the executive branch, the governor, the heads of departments who are awarding uh, expensive contracts or they're passing administrative rules like laws or making decisions about leases. Those types of lobbying efforts are not required to be reported under law because that's the executive branch. And the public really needs to know that as well as what's going on over at the legislature. Wow, that's a significant um, uh, hole. Yes, <laughs> yes, uh, because the state manages a lot of land, and land in Hawaii is very, very valuable. And so we do need to know what happens in those types of lobbying efforts. There was a, a hearing, uh, maybe it's still going now, actually, on the the um, permits, the water permits, and very interesting. And so. Sounds like um, maybe something will happen. Are you hopeful? Um, you know, the bill was heard on the Senate side. I believe it was deferred. I have oh. to check on what's going on on the House side for that. But, you know, again, the, the water, is a, it's a great issue. The lob registered lobbyists will be down at the legislature lobbying on those water bills. And Sierra Club is one set of registered lobbyists. Um, you know, a number of the private organizations that have water permits are also lobbying. And all their financial information on how much they're spending on that effort at the legislature is public. Uh, their donations to candidates are public. But the lobbying funds that are expended on the government agencies, the water commissioners themselves, uh, the Department of Land and Natural Resources, you know, where the, the body sits, that's not 
recorded. And this bill was intended to kind of close that whole loophole because a lot of important lobbying can go on at the executive level that people need to know about. And um, you're bravely um, moving forward in setting an example for uh, running a clean campaign. Well, you know, when I first decided to run, um, I guess it was four years ago now, uh, it was relatively soon after the whole Citizens United case came out, and I was really uncomfortable about how, you know, this dark money was affecting politics. So I just decided that across the board I was not going to take any contributions from any political action committee and just work mainly with individuals and small businesses um, with their support and just see if I could get elected that way. Because I just think you can try to change the law, but you can also live by you know, what you want to aspire to as well. So. And it uh, looks like uh, it's uh, proven. It worked the first time around. <laughs> we'll see what happens in this next election. Um, also in the ethics, um, you um, have there's some bills around uh, police. Um. Yes, so um, the, you know I'm a big believer in transparency. Uh, again, the, it gives the public confidence in government when that information is public. So we've had some issues recently where a few police officers have been caught on tape. Um, and the public wants to be assured that there are consequences for their actions where it's clear they weren't acting in accordance with you know, whatever their department policies are. Um, the current law says if a government employee has been sanctioned, uh, an administrative penalty, and they have their rights to appeal and due process, but once there's a final decision, the public has the right to know what the administrative charge was and what the penalty was but there's an exception for police officers. And I believe the vast majority of police officers are, are law-abiding, hardworking, you know, wonderful people that Definitely. we're very lucky to Definitely. have. But for the few bad apples, it really erodes the public trust in the entire force. And so uh, I have one of the bills I have is to uh, eliminate that exception for police officers and hold them to the same standards as all other public employees. And how is that faring? Um, we put the bill in last year. It did receive some hearings, but didn't move forward. So we put it in again this year. And uh, there's uh, a bill, my bill, but also some other legislators put in some bills as well. And I'm cautiously optimistic we're going to see some improvements in the oversight of law enforcement. But I'm not sure which bills are going to, to ultimately shake out. OK. Um, since you are the senator from uh, Waimanalo and Kailua, um, there is that sticky wicket of the um, of the B and Bs, um, yeah. and um, we'll we'll uh, let's let's get into it. Uh, we'll probably have to break, but um, let's let's get into that a little with um, again what what is ethical, what is the right thing to do here with regard to businesses and taxation and and what's happening what's happening in our communities? Um, well, you know, as you may know, um, there's uh, each of the counties handles the zoning for their county. So uh, where are residential districts, commercial districts, and then what are the permitted uses in the residential district? Um, and each county handles it a bit differently. The city and county of Honolulu has permitted, I think it's uh, between seven to 800 bed and breakfasts and vacation rentals to be run in residential districts on Oahu. But the Hawaii Tourism Authority did a survey where they went to one website where these are advertised and counted for the island of Oahu, I think well over 4,000. Um, vacation rentals and bed and breakfast being offered for short-term rentals um, and that's under 30 days. I, and I read that um, the Hawaii Visitor and Convention Bureau um, has dis determined that it's 40 percent of the visitors to Hawaii are now staying in vacation rentals so that includes bed and breakfasts but it includes also designated vacation rentals. I don't know. They haven't split that number out. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any I idea of, of, of how much, I mean, of the um, B&Bs are? There, uh, I mean, there's a lot. It, in and homes? There's, well, the, the ones that I'm talking about, the rough, the between four to 5,000 on Oahu are homes and apartments. 
um, a lot of them are the entire home or apartment. It's not like a single room. It's a unit, and many of them are one owner owning multiple units. Uh, on Maui, I think they have over eight, according to that one survey, over 8,000 um, vacation rentals in homes or condominiums there. Um, Kauai also has a significant number. So it's, it's a big issue across the state. Are, are you hearing from the um, hotel industry at all on um, wanting to um, clean this up a little bit, or do, do they seem to be uh, the not? The hotel industry is uh, down at the legislature, and what their position is is there needs to be a level playing field. Um, if there's going to be vacation rentals, then they should be um, open, transparent, you know, public. Um, they should be paying their taxes, they should be registering their businesses, and they should be providing the same you know, type of um, protections for customers that you know, hotels do in the event of a hurricane, tsunami, you know, if there's information that go to people about where to go. So the hotel industry is not uh, necessarily opposed to vacation rentals in residential homes, but they feel that the way that they've been operating now is really, um, they have an unfair advantage over the hotels. And um, what are you hearing from your constituents in, in, in Kailua, um, where this seems to be um, really a big issue? It, it is a very big issue. You know, it, it's, I'd say, it, to be fair, it's a very contentious issue. Obviously, the people who are running vacation rentals um, support them. And a number of the small businesses that cater to the visitors that are in the community support them. Uh, on the other hand, a lot of people in the community oppose them because, you know, on the street that they live, instead of having neighbors where they know them, yes. their kids play together, you know, it, it's, it's a constant rotating door. Um, it affects the property values. So you have somebody on a fixed income. Now these properties are being sold, these vacation rentals are being sold at prices that reflect that they're commercial operations. So the property values go up and now the homeowner who's living there has to pay higher property taxes. Um, and so that's an issue. And then, you know, is there housing available for residents, either for long-term rental or to purchase, you know, to live in the community? And that's a challenge. That seems to me really um, to be the crux of the matter for, for residents. It, it, it starts there, mm -hmm. um, but then it escalates um, to schools and neighborhoods and jobs and the price of groceries and everything else. Um, do, you, do you feel like there's, um, uh, or are you finding that there's um, uh, a place where these um, issues can be uh, dealt with um, a little more concretely. I mean, like really looking at how many how many homes are taken out of the the market and and where are those people going to go now that those spaces are are not available for mm -hmm. for locals to live. There, you know, there's some studies that have been done on housing um, in Hawaii and elsewhere because this is not just a Hawaii problem. You have other places like San Francisco, San Francisco you know, very York. desirable cities. Yeah. yeah, New York, where some of the housing stock is transitioning over. Um, and it has what is a couple effects. One is a, a ripple effect. So, you know, people say, oh, vacation rentals are only an issue in Kailua or Haleiwa mainly, and other places are all right. But you have residents who used to be able to get long-term rentals or purchase homes in those communities who no longer can. So they are going out to other communities, and that's affecting these other communities because there's more competition now for the housing. And then they have what's called a um, displacement effect. So again, people used to be able to, to rent, and we don't have enough housing for our local population. We have a housing shortage. Now the housing shortage is getting more severe. Instead of having you know 750 vacation rentals, you're having over 4,000 yes. um, just on Oahu. And you take a look at other places. You know, again, it's in the neighbor islands. It's affecting them even more. So there's not, there isn't, um, there's we we haven't figured it out yet. It, it it is a in order to figure it out, I think you need to deal with both the state level laws as well as the city and county laws. The zoning about, is it permissible? And if we are going to allow it, how many units are we going to allow in which communities? That's a city and county issue, or on the neighbor islands, the county issues, because they are in charge of zoning. 
but the state laws, I think, also have a role to play that we shouldn't be making it harder for the counties to be able to enforce their own regulations. Okay, I hear we have a tweet, but I don't see it. Um, ah, should the, ho should the hotel industry be honored in a state with the highest rates of homelessness and a failure to regulate rental rates? I, I'm guessing that what the person's saying is, since the hotel industry doesn't oppose vacation rentals and this is their position, should we respect that? I mean, that's the way I'm reading the question. And I, I would say that I don't think the hotel industry should decide the issue, but I don't think the hotel industry is, you know, the enemy or the cause of homelessness. I mean, that tourism is our, our number one industry. Um, but I think we do need to take a look at how is this affecting our housing for our local residents, the cost of housing, the availability of, you know, long-term rentals for the families that can't afford a down payment for a home. And that's a bigger industry, or a bigger question. Okay, well this feels like a good place to take a little pause and we'll come back and more on the B&Bs. Aloha, namaskar, and hello. My name is Anu Hittel, and I host the show called Climate Change Beyond Outrage. We go beyond outrage to find solutions to climate problems facing people, nations, and the world. I hope you will join me here every Tuesday at 1 o'clock. We broadcast live from thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha and bye-bye. Aloha. My name is Carl Campagna. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. You can see our show every Wednesday at noon at 12 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com, as well as visiting YouTube and finding the link for the show there. The show is also aired on OC16. We look forward to seeing you on the show. Uh, we have many wonderful guests, uh, including Joan Husted, Corey Rosenley, where we talk about the very important issues of education for our keiki. We look forward to seeing you there. Mahalo. Aloha. Welcome back to Hawaii is my mainland. Today I have Senator Laura Thielen from Kailua, Waimanalo, and Hawaii Kai. And we're having a discussion about about the effect of having 4,000 registered, or counted, BNBs, not registered, on the island of Oahu, and what, is, what that is doing to the fabric of our, of our society, what that's doing to the quality of, of neighborhoods. And um, I, I can't go through a day without, without that conversation about um, I'm losing uh, my place to live and I need to find another one and there's nothing available and and um, I won't go to um, Lani Kai because it might take me 45 minutes to <laughs> to leave if I need to leave and um, I don't want to go to Kailua anymore because um, it's just full of tourists and it's just it's become part of our our daily discussion and um, I'm, I'm hoping that there's a, there's a way that, I mean, maybe it's gone too far. Maybe, maybe there's too many people. I mean, when realtors are now calculating the rental income uh, as part of the value of, of, of the home, I, I mean, have we gone too far? Well, home values are tied to the rent that you can get from them. When, when, and so um, it's not just for Hawaii, you know, which is a desirable place to live and a desirable vacation spot. If you can rent a home for a long-term lease for, you know, two thousand a month for a year to a family, but you could also turn around and rent that home for three times that as a vacation rental, you know, and, and earn three times that income. Ultimately, you're affecting the housing prices in that community, and you see certain communities have changed, you know, their housing prices in response to that. Again, what that does is that moves people out of that community into surrounding communities or other communities where they then compete for that housing stock and drive up that price. Um, I guess what troubles me in this debate on vacation rentals is that the, many of the people I talk to who are in favor of them will say, well, if you just change the law, what I do would be legal. 
I have, I have a problem with that argument because the law is what the law is. And if you don't like the law, you try to go and change it. But it also makes me uncomfortable because then you'd say, OK, what if we change the law at that point? Would everybody agree to abide by that? Or are you going to have another crop of homeowners come on in and say, well, we want to do it too? So at what point does it end? And I was looking at a housing report um, that was done by the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. And they looked at the housing sales in Hawaii, uh, county by county, over the last seven years. And the island of Maui, more than half of the homes and condominiums that were bought over the past seven years were bought by people who were from the mainland or foreigners. That's new and resales. Yes. Wow. All, all home and condominium units over the past seven years, more than 50% are being purchased by out-of-state people, offshore investors. So, you know, when we talk about our cost of living, you know, th this shift to vacation rentals, timeshares, things like that is an affecting the housing prices for local residents. Um, not necessarily the affordable low end, but for the middle class and, residents. And as you said, there's a ripple effect. Yes. It, <laughs> remember uh, in the in the 80s in the in the Japanese bubble. Yes. All the, the, the all the Kahala refugees moved to Kailua and Lani Kai. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And now they're moving to well, shh, I won't say. Yes. <laughs> so um, how? Um, Jared Diamond wrote in his book, Collapse, um, about uh, the state of Mon Montana that mm. was facing this kind of inundation by outsiders driving land prices up. And their solution was to create um, a, a two-tiered tax system. And we've seen a little, I, I understand you're in the state legislature. You're mm. not at the county level. So mm. I, I'm not <laughs> saying, why haven't you done this? But just as a legislature and as somebody who has been digging deeply and who is a trained attorney, what do you, what do you think about um, having something with uh, really concrete that would say, OK, if you are um, a resident and you are in residence for, um, in Montana, I think they made it 180 days mm -hmm. or more a year then your tax rate is X. If you are not, then your tax rate is, you know, 5X. Mm -hmm. um, does, can you see something like that working? I, I guess I'd say, I think for our housing market, we, we have to, government needs to set some policies because in, if we don't have policies, because we have so many outside folks coming in here to buy, because Hawaii is a nice place to live, um, they tend to be older people, and our younger people are leaving because they can't afford it. So ultimately, in the absence of any policies, we end up with you know, a, an aging population without a younger population to support us. Our children can't stay here. Our grandchildren can't stay here. You know, it, just, it really changes the state, and we've seen this happen over time. But the big threats on the horizon, um, Asia, China, Korea, the amount of money that they're going to have for property investments, the fact that they're going to be looking for offshore investments. I think we're looking at you know, the Japanese bubble that hit us. Sooner or later, we're going to see a, a, a China bubble hit the real estate market. So unless we do something, we're going to get to the point where our local residents, you know, basically the middle class is going to end up with the younger generation fleeing Hawaii. And it's not going to work. The question is, what do we do? Because we don't want to do things and not have them, you know, get to the desired result. Right. I think, just me personally, because on the mainland they pay higher property taxes, because um, they fund their schools that way. We don't in Hawaii. We fund it from the GET. If you raise the property tax for offshore people, it's not going to deter them from buying it, um, because it's not, they're used to paying it. And so then, in some ways, the counties start to look at that as a revenue generation where we mm. like having those people buy properties because we get more money. So I, I wouldn't, mm. I, I'd, I think we need to consider it, but I don't know that it's going to by itself have the outcome that 
that you uh, have? Well, I can see how the, the foreign investors would be one, one set, and then the, Amer the California, the, the ones from the continent yeah. coming would be, I remember being so annoyed by um, a, a Microsoft executive who bought a beachfront home on Kailua and just saying, oh, it's so great. You guys have such low taxes here. Yeah. You should see what I have to pay in Snohomish. And you just, ah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and I'm irritated because the state, you know, 20 years ago, we put, I'm told, about $200 million in Kaka'ako building the infrastructure, created this one-stop shop permits for the developers because that was supposed to be our workforce housing core. And now what they're building almost uniformly is multi-million dollar condominiums. And, and here we are, we have a housing shortage. One of the luxury condos just announced that they're pulling back on the project from lack of demand. There's not a lack of demand for housing in Hawaii, but the market is building towards very high-end, primarily offshore investment. So how do we protect um, Mr. and Mrs. Lee, who are in their late 70s and have their little house in Kaneohe or Kaimaki and want to be able to spend the rest of their days yeah. there? You know, I think, again, it's going to be a state and county solution. I, I think the county have to come up with what is going to be the permissible amount of vacation rentals that they're going to allow because they're not going to go away. But I think the, um, the compromise is let, you know, they should pass a number but make it enforceable because the way it is right now, it's very difficult to enforce. And then can, try can to... Can you talk about that, the yeah. enforcement issue? Um, the way I passed a bill in the legislature last year that requires the vacation rental owners to have their TAT license number posted online. And if you don't post it, that by itself is a violation. So the, what the counties are doing now is they're having to go on out and catch people staying there at the units for less than 30 days and say, aha, you're violating the law. They could pass an ordinance that just says, you have to put your permit number up there. And if you are advertising a vacation rental without your permit number posted, that's a violation. And if you put up a false permit number, that's a violation. And advertising without a permit number is a violation. And what are those violations? What do you get if, you're, if you have a violation? Um, what I found when I was at DLNR is if you want to stop commercial, illegal commercial activities, you have to make the fine higher than the income that's being generated by the illegal activity. And is that the case? No, I don't believe so. It's not. Yeah. Well, it's, but right now the challenge is not necessarily the fines. It's that they have to go out and find people in the unit who admit that they're staying there under 30 days. So instead, you just make it, you know, if you're permitted, post it, and anybody advertising without a permit is violating the law. Just that's cut and dry. Yeah, that seems like a, a, a very um, efficient yeah. way to pursue that. But there are some clever lawmakers out there, and they've come up with an interesting way around that this season, haven't they? Yes. <laughs> uh, on the taxing. you want to talk about that bill? There's a bill, actually, uh, my understanding is it's being proposed by Airbnb, not necessarily. I mean, it came through lawmakers, but I, my understanding is Airbnb wrote the bill. And basically, is it would allow uh, Airbnb to become an authorized state agent to collect the taxes so that any unit advertised on Airbnb could basically go underground. They wouldn't have to get a TAT, they wouldn't have to get a GET, they wouldn't have to post anything on their websites, and you couldn't get that information from Airbnb without a subpoena. Wow. Yeah. Well, let's uh, take a breath and uh, take a break and digest that one for a minute. <laughs> okay, this is Think Tech Hawaii. And it's Wednesday. Every Wednesday is Energy Wednesday here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy. 4 to 5 p.m. every Wednesday. Come and listen to us. And just to show you what I mean, I'm going to ask Sharon to tell us more. Come and see us every Wednesday, as Jay said. And we have people like Jim Alvarez from HECO here and co-host Ray Starling here every Wednesday. We not only go on Olelo and OC16, but also stream live. So please come visit us. Hear about the latest in clean energy. Okay, Jim, you've been here. You got any comment on all this? 
as important as energy is in all of our lives today, this is a great forum and a great format to vet those issues. So I encourage everybody to listen in and participate. Okay, Ray, what do you think for a close? Well, I, I think this is the greatest show uh, in the energy world here in Hawaii. Uh, you can come here every week, one hour, and catch the latest on what's happening and hear from the people who really know what's going on. Uh, like Jim Alberts, we appreciate your coming today. Thank you. Ray Starling, Sharon Murray Waki, Jim Alberts, and Jay Fidel here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. 4 to 5 p.m. Wednesday. Aloha. 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 Welcome back to Hawaii is my name, mainland. I am Kaui Lucas, and with me today is Senator Laura Thielen. And we are going to uh, jump over to a new topic, um, not a new topic for the show, or certainly not for uh, Senator Thielen, uh, the leaky Red Hill fuel tanks. Oh, my gosh. If you go to um, KauiLucas.com on my blog, I have posted um, uh, links to Senator Thielen's excellent report. Um, but give us, give us the, the skinny. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I guess there are these 20 huge, huge fuel tanks. They were built, what they're called, in the field, where the, the, um, out in Red Hill to provide fuel to um, Pearl Harbor. And the, the rock was actually blasted with dynamite. This was right around uh, World War II. And then the tanks were built into the pukas in the rock. But it, it fissured the rock. And these 20 ah. tanks, which hold something like a 250 million gallons of jet fuel, um, pretty much according to reports that weren't discovered by the state until much, much later, started leaking um, regularly. Because again, these are, these are giant tanks. Uh, they don't meet modern standards for underground storage tanks. It's a single wall tank, not a double wall, not necessarily any sensors. And there were a number of leaks, um, some fairly large, some where they just said they had leaked, but they hadn't recorded you know, how much. But recently, there was a, a fairly large That's the, discharge of the oil. 27,000 gallons. And according to your report, that was a, a matter of days after yes. they had been inspected the, the post tank, repair. Yes, and so what the, the Navy had said is you don't need to worry about these tanks. We periodically we drain them, we inspect them, we seal them on the inside. We have alarm systems now, everything's fine. So they did that with this one tank, they refilled it, the alarms went off and they said, oh, it can't be a leak. And they just continued to refill it. And uh, a couple of days later, they realized that it was at 27,000 gallons, gallons. And they don't know where it went. But obviously, you know, it's going down through what remains in the, the granite. And right below that granite, in a fairly short distance, I think about 100 feet, is one of our main aquifers that serves nearly a quarter of the island. Do we know that that aquifer has not been affected? Um, from my understanding and talking with the Board of Water Supply, uh, there are some contaminants on the surface of the aquifer, but we do not have enough wells dug to be able to de determine how far that may have spread and then also other locations around the aquifer where contaminants from all these former leaks may still be working their way down through the granite. Um, and this is, again, you know, our, our drinking water supply, some of the purest water in the world. And it's, we have great water. But and once an aquifer is contaminated, it's virtually impossible to clean it up. According to your report here, that the, the aquifer provides fresh water to one quarter of urban Honolulu from Moana Lua to Hawaii Kai. Yes. I don't know how many um, Oahu residents know that we pump water from uh, Red Hill to Hawaii Kai. That was, that was pretty stunning. Yeah. Well, Oahu is the only island where we have an interconnected water system. So if you turn on the tap on the windward side, you know, the, the, they can send water anywhere. So it's not necessarily, it, yeah, it is basically pumped and serves that entire region. Okay, so who's, um, so the the land where the tanks are 
uh, belongs to the Navy or on, in some form. The military, yes. And they are uh, responsible for taking care of this. Yes. Is there any state uh, interaction here? I mean, there, I would think that the EPA maybe would have something to say to this. The, um, both the EPA and the state have authority, now that the, the discharge has been reported, um, they both had authority. They had the option to shut the tanks down. Uh, obviously, there was a lot of pressure from the military not to shut the tanks down for, and, and a number of other people as well. So the Navy agreed to enter into what was called a um, consent agreement with the EPA and the state to say what they needed to do. And then that's where, when we sat down and started to negotiate that, um, I feel that the state did not do as good a job as it should have in representing the state interest in the agreement it ultimately reached with the Navy. It's, uh, from what I read, 15 of those tanks um, are still in use. It, under the agreement, the Navy has uh, at least 22 years and possibly longer to upgrade the tanks. It has five years to decide what upgrade means. They do not have to upgrade the, the tanks to current modern standards. And if the state disagrees with whatever the Navy says, this is what it's going to do, the state has waived its authority to veto that decision, and it's going to be up to the federal government, not the state. Is, is there what is the, how does the hierarchy work between the EPA and, and the Navy? I don't, not, not sure. Does the Navy have to? You know, my worry is when it becomes a federal decision, you know, does Congress, is it going to value the United States military more than the residents of the state of Hawaii who are drinking their water out of that aquifer? Um, and I think Congress is going to come down on the side of the federal government and not necessarily the residents of the state of Hawaii. The state has a public trust obligation to provide you know, care for our water resources, including our drinking water supply for all of our residents. This fuel is, contains contaminants that are highly carcinogenic. If that aquifer is contaminated, it will not be able to be cleaned and what is our alternative water supply for a quarter of urban Honolulu? What? Yeah. <laughs> there isn't one, is what you're saying. Well, there's not enough, I don't believe, in the other aquifers without endangering them by overpumping. So then you're going to have to start to talk about desalination of ocean water, which raises a whole bunch of other issues when you're on an island and you have a limited area okay. to... One of those in issues is cost. I cannot believe that the, the, the cost of, to the Navy of building replacement tanks, um, why do they have to be underground? Why can't they be above ground? We have plenty of above ground fuel tanks. Do you know what their pushback on that is? Uh, you know, I think there are other alternatives for the Navy where we're not compromising military preparedness. And that, that tends to be kind of the go-to thing in the negotiations. But the reality is there are alternatives. Um, this is fueling the Pacific region, so they could start to spread fuel around in a variety of places. They can do above ground tanks, or they can build tanks within the existing tanks to the modern standards, which allows you to basically keep the entire system you know, underground, keep your gravity feed lines, but you just make sure that maybe instead of holding 250 million gallons in 20 tanks, you, know, you have smaller tanks inside of these tanks that can hold you know, 150 to 175 million gallons, but they're secure. Well, that sounds incredibly rational, reasonable, and probably a, a good buy economically. I mean, when we see what's happening in Flint, Michigan, for instance, uh, what um, I'm, do you think that maybe that's going to wake up some of the politicians here or the, the Navy, somebody? This is where I think we need really strong advocates in government around issues that have long-term ramifications because right now you have a decision being made as the Navy saying this is how much it's going to cost us to do stuff and we can't do it now versus the risk of maybe, you know, in 10 years this water supply being contaminated. And people, they, they give too much weight on the immediate cost and not enough you know, on the long term. And that's what happened in Flint. 
and you know the cost if our aquifers get contaminated will dwarf the cost of fixing any of these tanks right right so um, well I guess it's uh, there's nothing that the legislature can do about this is there you know the, there is some uh, bills one is would be funding the Department of Health to provide it with additional inspectors um, there are supposed to be reports and, and benchmarks that are met by the Navy along the way one of my worries is you set up an agreement that in 25 years will do something well by that time you get there and if you haven't done it everybody who was around you know originally making the agreement is gone so we need to make sure that the Department of Health pulls the trigger on any consequences if they fail to meet deadlines. The biggest one coming up is when the Navy decides what kind of upgrade it's going to provide to the tanks. And we want to make sure that the Department of Health, uh, with the Board of Water Supply, because Department of Health said support this agreement, Board of Water Supply didn't like the agreement, the Commission on Water Resource Management didn't like the agreement, people were saying don't sign it, Health went ahead and signed it. So we want to make sure that the state acts more as a unit with all of our bodies that are in charge of caring for the water when we take a look at is what the Navy is proposing adequate or not. So maybe now that we have an engineer in the <laughs> Washington place, um, somebody who can understand these, these issues a little better, maybe, maybe it'll... Uh, be louder or uh, actually I, I'm just I'm just, I'm so stunned when you know two weeks ago Marty Townsend from uh, Sierra Club was on on the program and, and she started talking about I was like what you mean we haven't fixed that I thought we fixed that years ago so um, no. uh, wow so it's really something that could happen um, after reading your report um, and again, if you go to kawilucas.com, you'll see Laura's beautiful face, and um, there's links to the report. Um, and you can also go to her, her um, uh, website. Um, I'm putting some, now that we, we can see really painfully through Flint, mm -hmm. Flint's exper uh, experience, how, how horrible this can be on so many levels. And, and Maybe there's a, a, a chance here to uh, get some more movement. I mean, your, your solutions, I mean, where's, can we get the Navy to the, the table on this? Um, you know, they already made the agreement. And like I said, the next, the next uh, big time for the state to weigh in is when the Navy comes back and says, okay, here's how we can upgrade the tanks. In my opinion, they're going to come up with something that is going to be... Um, clearly not modern standards. I mean, you're talking about tanks that are already 70 to 75 years old. Yeah, so 20 so, years, we have to wait 20 years yes. to, to go to the table again? Yes, and so, so the big fight that next is going to be when the Navy says, here's what we can do. We can, you know, spray it with a sealant. We can, you know, do whatever. It, it, the state should hold them to say, let's do modern standards. The modern standards are in place because we found out that all the other things that we did don't prevent leaks. And because this is 100 feet above our primary aquifer, we need to expend the money there to do that. I think the best thing that people can ask for is don't let Department of Health make that decision on its own. Include the Board of Water Supply, include the Commission on Water Resource Management, because they have the long-term perspective about the health of our waters. So that's getting all these agencies together to come to the table. And hopefully and we they're there. They're, the the they're other there. two agencies are there. They want to be a part of it. It's a matter of Department of Health letting them have an equal place at the table. Oh. Well, thank you so much for coming mm -hmm. and talking to me today, um, Senator Thielen. And I have to say, I was, I was so upset about this <laughs> Red Hill um, tank leak uh, flint incident happening in our community that um, I, uh, I did call Board of Water Supply, and um, uh, in a few weeks, um, Ernie Lau will be okay. here to um, give us more from, from their perspective. And um, thank you so much for being so on it and vigilant and smart. Well, I'm glad that you're having Ernie Lau here. He's done an excellent job with the whole Red Hill response. He deserves a lot of credit. Thanks again. We'll see you next Friday on Hawaii is my mainland. I'm Kaui Lucas. Have a great weekend. Thank you.